Boys, episode 40. We've done Crazy, three of these bad boys. Crazy, man. Crazy to think. Gone? Yeah, it's insane. It would have been – so that'll be almost 40 weeks. There'll be a couple of weeks where there was two, but pretty much 40 weeks straight. Yeah, because obviously I did a couple of doubles recently with some interviews, but then we had yeah. time off over Christmas. We had two weeks off, so – Oh, yeah. I think, I think we started in June. That's what I was going to ask. When's the anniversary? I think it's June. I'll have to have a look. It might be June – I feel like for the, uh, the the anniversary edition, we should just do it all round table together. Yeah, well, I think we got to go to a location and all be yeah, yeah. together. Someone yeah. someone said the other day when you when you get to a milestone, will you all do it together and like invite a crowd? We can do that, like a live, like a live party. Yeah, we can do that for sure. They just hire hire like a venue, or we could just have it at my gym. Yeah, hundred percent. Have it at my yeah, gym because it it'll be comps will be over. It'll be June. We'll be good. Yeah, let's do it. Do people want to see that? You okay. want to, do you want to see us all together and a little bit of a live? Like maybe just like 30, 30 seats, 30 seats. Yeah. All right. Reach out anyone if you think that's a good idea. Otherwise, yeah. just be us talking yeah. around, but we're still going to do it anyway. But we do twice a week anyway. <laughs> um, I'm pumped, boys. This is the first show coming up this Sunday to kick off yeah. the season. So it's officially peak week for, I bet, a lot of newbies, like a lot of first-timers. Um I remember how I felt first time. Do you guys remember your first one and how you felt? Yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah, I was super nervous, man. Super, super nervous. Um, and, you know, you don't know, like, your first ever peak week. And it's funny, you think all these magical things are going to happen, you yeah. know, like, because you've heard about peak week, people have <laughs> yeah. been talking, and you're like, I'm going to go from, like, 10% body fat to, like, four overnight. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> all the manipulations. All that manipulation, but... Yeah, I just remember the nerves. I remember the nerves on the the morning of the show. Mm-hmm. Like, um, I was I couldn't sit still. I remember just walking from one room to the next room. Uh, but crazy, crazy excitement. And I just remember the feeling of looking at myself and going, "Wow, I can't believe that's you." You know that that yeah. you know because you got the tan on for the first time. Yeah, that dark, and you look at yourself in the mirror. You know, every thirty five seconds, and you just you know you're flexing your abs or. And yeah. having never experienced it before, it truly is one of the greatest feelings ever, man. And it's literally the reason why all of us keep coming back because it feels so good. Hundred percent. I, I like the one of the biggest um, tips I can give people is obviously it's your first time. Like, really try to enjoy it. I know you're going to be nervous, but really try to enjoy it and mm. try to get f- photos with your family and friends. Like, don't just rip off your shoes and your bikini and be like, I'm just going to get back into like try to just get some photos of family and friends because I'm I bet you they're dying to uh to congratulate you and see you and support you. So make sure you get some photos with uh family and friends and loved ones too. So um yeah. Yeah. First time don't, yeah. I, I love and it. Don't don't be don't be nervous about the crowd. Like a little bit of nerves is good, but just know that everyone that's in that crowd is either the family member of someone who's competing or another competitor who mm. absolutely understands the journey and the sacrifice you've made to get to that point. And yep. everybody is just wishing you well and wants to see you have fun and enjoy yourself. And no one in the crowd really cares about placings in terms of other than where the person they're watching comes. So yep. everyone's just there to see you have fun and enjoy it. So definitely just try and take a moment, enjoy it. And um, and yeah, because the day flies, doesn't it? It definitely flies. Another thing to, to do is... Like, you can't see much. When you're on stage, the lights are so bright, you can barely see the judges and maybe the first row of people. The rest is just black, right? So I always say just look into the blackness and smile and just concentrate on what you're doing. Don't worry about anyone else. Remember your number and remember what pose you're in, right? Because when they ask you to do a quarter turn, you've got to know, am I in a front pose? Am I in a side pose? What am I doing? So just remember that. And I also recommend don't look at the judges because yeah. firstly you'll be looking down, which is not a good head position to have, right? And also it can throw you off. If you look at the judges and you might, might be like, why aren't they looking at me? Why are they looking at me? Why are they pointing at me? Why aren't they pointing at me? You start to and you see people look at the judges and they're just overthinking it. The smile goes, their face drops. You see a concerned look on their face. Don't worry about the judges. Just listen for your number. Know what pose you're in, look into the into the darkness and just concentrate on what you're doing. And then when you have your pose down, try to find your family and friends and walk to that side of the stage that they're on. Because they're some of the best photos you can get is when you're doing a pose down, you walk to the edge of the stage where your family are, they walk right up and they take some really, really good photos of you. So 
make sure you you look for your family whenever you're uh you're in a pose down. Definitely. But yeah, it's exciting. I know, Scotty, you're not you can't come because you're going to be on holiday, right? Yeah, unfortunately, I'll be living vicariously through you boys. But um, you'll have to do a live for me. There's a couple of divisions that uh, we've already spoken about that I, I want to get a bit of a peek at. So hopefully, MG, you'll be able to just run a live or just video it for me and then um, and send it through. Because I don't know, are they doing a live stream? I don't think so. But probably not, probably not we, for this one. But What we spoke about is we'll do a review. We'll do a review of the show. And the placings and the winners, and um, we'll we'll do that on the the next potty next week, and we'll have a bit of a chat about who some standouts were, who some people to look out for, yeah, and definitely. maybe some feedback for anyone. So let's do this. If you compete on the weekend and you want us to check you out and give you feedback, let us know. We'll look out for you, and then we'll talk about it on the next potty for you. So just reach out to the prep coach uh, account, DM or DM any of us. And say, hey, I'm I'm going to be there. This is my number. Look out for me. I'd love to know your feedback, and more than happy to uh, to give you some feedback. Yeah, it's awesome, man. Sound good? Mm-hmm. For sure. Uh, we got some questions. One was, do we have any winners <laughs> for the weekend? Um, MG, do you have a do you have a winner on your team? What do you reckon? <laughs> oh man, all my team are already winners. But you know, we always yeah. spoke about this. You never know who's going to win. I've got two amazing athletes. On literally opposite ends of the spectrum, I've got an incredible 55-year-old men's fitness athlete, which actually, MT, you were kind enough to do some posing with while mm. he was practicing on the weekend. And just like like the condition for the age, man, is, is uh, phenomenal. It looks amazing. It looks amazing, right? Scotty, yeah. you'd, be, you'd be proud of this conditioning, man, because we know, we know you love it. And then on the other end of the spectrum, I've got a young 23-year-old physique guy who's just... You know, very genetically blessed, but has put the work in, and um, this is his first show. We're doing a couple others this season, but he, you know, he's definitely going to going to be up there in the conversation. And I'm just excited, man. I can't wait to to see it. And they're both super pumped and super excited. Are they going to be winners? Who knows, man? I've got no idea who's going to show up, but it's going to be an awesome day nonetheless. And um, you know, I, I, I'm one of those coaches. You you know this, MT. If I'm not even if I'm competing, but if my team's competing, I get a restless night's sleep the night before. <laughs> I can't sleep, man. I'm too excited. I keep tossing, turning. I think I'm going to miss my alarm. So, um, so they'll probably have a better night's sleep than me, I reckon. <laughs> For sure. Like you're, you're, you're a massive stress head. I am. I am. It's been bored. I think even Tony, once upon a time from ICN, has um, looked over at me when I've had one of my team members on the stage, and he's just looked over at me and just gone, relax, like just <laughs> breathe, relax. Yeah, because because I do love it. I do get very passionate about it. But yeah, we're so, we're so invested. Like, aren't we, Scotty? Like, we're so absolutely, invested. man. Yeah. This is the thing I think for a lot, a lot of athletes, especially when, you, as an athlete, when you're you've got your coach's hat on, you know the responsibility that's being bestowed on you to obviously to guide these guys through such a you know a massive um, event, to, especially if it's their first time you know competing when they're up there because you've ridden the wave with them in terms of the ups, the downs. Everyone just sees the end product and marvels at how great they look. But only really you and them and perhaps their partner have a real understanding of what took place to get to that point. So there's an element of, you know, respect, admiration, but also you're just so proud to see that they got up there. And, you know, the result is just a, um, you know, it's it's second in the sense that just being there and knowing that they've given everything, they've left no stone unturned like that, as you said before, MG, that's the win. And then however you place at the end of the day, it's subjective. It just comes down to to the judges, but you can't let the the success of your day be um, measured by where four or five people on a panel deem you to be in a lineup of six or seven people. Yeah, yeah definitely. Just bear that bear that in mind. Also, too, is be humble in victory and in defeat too, because we see it all the time where someone might do amazing, they might win, and they they're on a high, they think they are absolutely amazing. Then they go to another show and they lose. And it's like you can just see the life get drained out of them, right? So be hum- humble in victory and defeat. You know, you may be absolutely amazing, do amazing on the day. But just remember, the next show is a new show, new competitors. It's a new challenge, okay? And just have an underdog mentality every single time to try to improve. And yeah. this also goes with um, coaches because there actually might be some coaches that are first-time coaches at this show too who have – coach for the first time and have first time competitors same goes with you guys be humble in defeat and in victory too if your client doesn't win it's not the be all and end all and it doesn't mean that you're a bad coach in any way and also if your client 
wins doesn't mean you're the best, most amazing coach ever. It means you just had some success. Be humble in it and uh, continue to try to level up every single time. And remember, you're probably going to be the first face they see when they come off stage. So if there's expectations, perhaps they came second and they didn't win and they may be feeling disheartened. And if you're – the first thing you say is that was an effing joke, you know, you're yeah. wrong versus you looked incredible, that was a tough lineup. Like be supportive uh, because otherwise – if you don't, that's essentially going to frame the narrative in terms of how they view their experience, that lineup yes. versus just celebrating that they look great, they presented well, um, the results are If you don't win, that's okay. What do we need to do to get better? Just try and frame it around being positive because essentially the, what what you say and how you your body language is communicated to them is essentially going to be how they're going to be for the next hour, two hours or for the rest of the day. Yes. You want to set yes. them up for success thereafter rather than just it might be their first division, they come second and they're upset because they could have won. But going into it, they may have thought they weren't even going to place. So second is unbelievable. Like if you get on the podium in your first show, it's an incredible achievement. Yeah. Everyone wants to win, but there can only be one winner. That's a, that's a really, really good um, advice there, Scotty. So, like as a coach, like you're the first person they're going to see when they come off stage. Mm-hmm. Don't be positive about the experience. Um, don't yeah, don't say things like you got robbed, you should have won, those kind of things, because they're just going to be deflated and just not enjoy themselves. They've got other divisions coming up, they're not going to enjoy, yeah. they're going to be thinking about it. Just if there's something that they need to improve for their next division, hey, when you pose, do this, do that. Actually, when you did this, it was great. Give them that kind of feedback and those kind of suggestions. If it's the last category and that's the one and they're done and they're done for the day, just give them positive affirmations, just make sure that they enjoy the day and the experience. There will be time to talk about the show and the feedback and improvements and how things should have went or how things um, might have went differently and things like that. But it's not a time and place straight as they come off stage, right? Yeah, yeah. In, the, in, in that moment, you're basically painting the picture of how they're going to view the sport moving forward, yeah. the whole sport. So mm-hmm. if that experience is they come off stage, they're disappointed in their result, and then you make it a negative one, you've just the whole sport just instantly becomes tarnished in their eyes. 100%. So, like, you've just got the opportunity to protect them and obviously protect the sport we all love so much too. Yeah, 100%. The next thing we got, Scotty, a lot of people are asking about, are you going to document your prep uh, on the potty as you go through yours? My prep? Yeah, yours. Oh, uh, I don't know. I, I actually have had a couple of people at the gym ask if I was going to do that because in 2020, I did a bit of a... Um, Docu series. series. It wasn't as consistent as I would have liked because it just... It got on hard with <laughs> kids and lockdowns and everything. But, um, yeah, maybe. I'm probably not the greatest with being consistently posting in social media because I don't have a lot of time to liberate <laughs> yeah. to that. I know that's a pretty lame excuse, but I don't know. If people were interested in it, maybe, I guess, I could. You know, we could just, we we can just do an update on the potty every week. Yeah, we'll get, mm-hmm. we'll get an update from you every but, week. But, I mean, maybe even to the point of, like, you know, would you be – would you consider, you know, giving weekly stats – you know, where you were, weight, you know, maybe changes in cows if you ever have one. And just to give people like a really good start to finish rundown of what, you know, a pro champion um, does from day one till day show. Show, show us your abs, give us yeah, a we, flex, you know, that yeah, kind of we, stuff. We want to see all that. I wouldn't mind giving metrics in terms of, I tend to be a little, when I'm in prep, I don't really, I don't ever get out of a hoodie until I'm like literally about five minutes to, to get on stage. Everyone knows that. Yeah, I don't, that's true. I don't like to... It's not that side of it that appears to me. I like the grind, the you know, the, the hustle. But yeah, for sure. Jenny actually said to me, my wife asked, she she suggested I should do like a journal series for myself, where even if it's just three, five minutes, whatever each week, and if I want to post on social media, I can. But I'm more than happy to, if if people are interested. I mean, I don't, if they are, they are. I'm happy to do that. We can we can chat about it. The highs, the lows. I'll always be really transparent on that front. The only thing sometimes, if you're talking about specific metrics and macros a lot whenever i'm in prep i feel like a lot of people become very obsessed about the amount of food or Mm -hmm. the intakes when they're really just bespoke to to me and i'm always cautious that you know i don't want people to think that just because i'm able to eat x amount or i'm doing this doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for 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 someone else but i think to be fair though we're probably at a stage now where everyone should be big enough to know that it you know, what works for MT versus MG versus me, it's all going to be different. So, yeah, if, if people want to know about the nuts and bolts, we can do that. It would be good to at least know the, the, the some lessons learned or things that you tried 
and that worked. They're like, okay, yeah. look, I, I hit a plateau. So what I decided to do was drop about 200 cows. I took yeah. that cows from carbs, maybe a little bit of fats. Would it, and then, yep, well, I got a result. Yeah, that type of information is good. Like yeah. that kind of stuff, you know what I mean? Yeah, 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 sure. I'd like to know, like, maybe the reasons why you're adjusting certain things and what you're trying to do and what you're trying to achieve. Mm-hmm. I think that'll be good. Well, a question I actually have for you is, do you kind of ch- check in with yourself or do you have, you know, like the tracking sheet that you have for all your clients, do you have one for yourself? I do, man. The exact same checking system that you guys have, I fill it in every single week as though I'm about to send it to someone else. And then okay. I typically won't look at it the day that I have written it. I'll normally come back to it about 24 hours. So my, my check-in week runs Monday to Sunday. So mm-hmm. that's how my weeks um, align. And the qualitative stuff, um, I'm, I'm probably a little bit more vague in the improvement season because there's not as much to really um, mm. speak about. But one thing that I do a lot of in prep is I actually journal um, just because it helps. If I Obviously, I have a lot with my family and business and stuff. It helps sometimes to prevent me just storing stuff upstairs and not perhaps being the best version of myself. I can get it out, read it back, and then analyze it and look at it through a bit more of a clearer lens. Um, but yeah, I do. I track all of my metrics, sleep, food, hunger, all those things so that, again, it, it prevents me from being too close to something in terms of if I'm not tracking any of those metrics and I'm eight weeks out and I could be like one kilo off stage weight, I'm like, no, nah, nah, I need to push more. Whereas if I'm looking at all my metrics and I have a plan going into it, which is already um, being mapped out, I've got markers and checkpoints that I know that I need to hit. And so it's just like no different to anyone else that I'm working with in terms of taking them along. And then um, Jen is a really good feedback loop for me in the sense that she thinks that perhaps I need to pull back a bit and she's okay. pretty honest on that front. Ooh, um, okay, that's cool. the same. And I've obviously got you boys, I'm sure, you know, down the, the track. If I, you know, if I'm like, oh, I wouldn't mind having your opinion, you boys would always would always give it to me. Um, I'm, sure. I'm really big on honest feedback and not having anyone, you know, tell me what. Because I think sometimes in our sport, it can be very easy. People are like, you know, you look great at like 10 weeks out. You're ready now. And it's like, well, you're not ready now. Like mm. you've got a little bit more that, and only true people that have been in it for a long time perhaps really know, yeah. you know, where you need to be and also how you're feeling. You know, if you're still feeling really good, for me, if I'm feeling amazing in eight weeks out, it means I'm probably not lean enough. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah. We're, we're all here to support you, bro. And if you ever need us to look at anything. Yeah, I think what I think what I translate that to is from 12 weeks out, he wants a joint video from me and you every week analyzing his stats. I think that's how I understand that. Yeah. Done. Um, yeah, I don't know, John, but sharing all of the, 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 I guess, the real levels of my new show um, with you guys. But yeah, one thing I don't normally, I, typically I'll do maybe like one or two updates through prep. I'll probably do um, a starter prep where I'm starting from and then mm-hmm. I'll probably go dark on the physique front till I feel like yeah. doing one. Yeah, we get it. Uh, yeah. Whilst we're talking about comps, uh, we got a question about... Um, the difference between regional and state shows, um, why would you do one over the other? Now, MG, you don't run any regionals in Victoria. I know I know in New South, A&B run some regionals, right? Is that right? Well, they run a Western Sydney, yeah. 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 Um, but nothing in Vic yet. Well, you, well you, you may have a cheeky smile because you may have some inside information as to something that's coming <laughs> next year. This, but, this, okay, so, this, is the show, this is the show of letting the cat out of this this is what we should be I'm called now. <laughs> Perfect. You're yeah. a promoter. You might Absolutely. have a regional show in future. Yes. Why would someone do a regional over, or why would you pick a regional versus a metro, a, a state show? What would be the, the draw card there? And what's the well, difference between them? Yeah, well, I mean, there's not really a difference in terms of what the show offers. There's no difference in categories, divisions. The judges are going to be exactly the same. Everything about the show is going to be the same. It's literally just to give an opportunity to athletes who live a little further away to do a competition where they don't have to drive two to three hours and they're competing against people who are also living and trading in the same regions that they are. Yeah. Um, But, uh, you know, what also tends to happen is, you know, and, 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 you know, this is something that I hope will eventually change is like that a lot of, say, um, metro people in, in, in any state will use it as like a starting show or sometimes a warm-up show. Yep. Um, but what I, want, what I want to create in A&B, and we have something that's coming next year, which I won't announce now, but something very exciting is coming next year, is that, you know, these regional shows become as, as high quality, equal caliber yeah. and like equal 
equal rewards, championships, chances to earn pro cards as state shows, as yeah. Metro shows. And I think with us, you know, we, we obviously have a, a system where, you know, we do give pro cards out on merit. And that'll be something that will be taking to the regional shows because if there's a regional athlete that presents a physique that's worthy, then they shouldn't have to do a Metro show just to earn that card. Yeah, perfect. I know, like, I utilise them for someone that maybe wants to stick to one federation only. They don't want to travel interstate for any other shows. Yeah. The federation only offers one state and one regional show. They want to do two shows. They do both of them, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we utilise them that way too. Um, actually, I think... So there's no regionals in Season A across any of the Vic Feds, not that I know of. And in Season B, I think only ICN are running a regional in Ballarat, not Bendigo this year. They ditched Bendigo, did they? Yeah, they ditched Bendigo. That's um, good. It's too far. If you haven't listened to the Tony Lanciano podcast, they are doing a Winter Championships in June uh, this year. That's not classified as a regional. That's still going to be at the same facilities he's running his other season A shows. Uh, yeah, so there's only going to be one regional in Victoria this year, and it'll be later in the year in season B. Um, but I know that other states run. I think Queensland run a regional. New South Wales run a regional for different federations and things like that. So, yeah. Uh, we, we, we will make the A and B announcement on this show for, for next year's regional show. Nice. Can't wait to know where it is, mate. <laughs> Um, someone asked this question and maybe you can answer it MG2 is if you are competing in the same federation but across different states do you need a different memberships for every state no no definitely not it's a it's a it's a nationwide membership ours is ICN's is the same yeah I'm sure Stu's the same as well yeah so, it's all nationwide it's yeah. all nationwide yeah all right let's get into the nuts and bolts so someone asked uh, we've spoken about doing shows back to back weekends but we haven't spoken about doing shows on back-to-back -back days. So a Saturday show, then a Sunday show. Yep. So I know that um, it definitely happens. I don't know if you've done it before, Scotty. It definitely well, we, 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 we all did it at Nationals. But yeah, we, we did it at Nationals. All so, three of us, yeah. Yeah, ICN Nationals um, uh, last year. They normally run a two-day format. The Day one is the open divisions and day two is the other subcategories, you know, 30 plus novice, novice. Blah, blah, blah. They're actually changing that this year. Um, but that's when you have to do a Saturday and Sunday. So I had a, two clients do that, uh, Saturday, Sunday. Did you have someone, MG? Yeah, at least, right? Yeah, Elise. at least, yeah. 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 Did you have anyone, Scotty? Uh, I had was. Yeah, it was. It yeah. was. So how would you, let's talk about how you tackle it from like a guy, like for a male who's super shreds, obviously and trying to do something back to back like that. Yeah, so it's it's funny, I've actually been giving this a lot of thought because this is actually probably gonna to apply to my season B because the IPV shows on a Saturday and mm -hmm. Stu's mentioned that the pro show for NBA probably on the Sunday. Yeah. So I think if it's a assuming well whether it was hopefully you're able on the Saturday to compete in the day, not at night, because the closer the window of time that the shows are together the more difficult it can become because essentially when you're looking at peaking for show number one, you obviously want to make sure that you are at your very best. You are making some slight manipulations to, you know, push in acute doses of sodium to enhance the look. But the recoil of that is that perhaps two or three hours afterwards, you can start to see some edema and you start to flatten out and you can hold a bit of water. So typically if you didn't have a show the next day, I send all of my athletes to the gym to try and wash off all that carbohydrate, wash off um, some of that sodium, hydrate well. It would be no different. So the way that I apply it is um, straight to the gym, put it on, try and sweat as much as we can in terms of um, getting some of that soap out, uh, soap, salt out because we excrete <laughs> sodium in our sweat. Soaked. <laughs> uh, hydrate well, push in quite a, a decent amount of um, potassium. And from a food perspective, not really eat anything at all because muscle glycogen stores will be absolutely through the roof. Yep. And if anything, all you want to try and do is wash off some of the additional carbohydrate potentially if you have spilled. And a lot of the times you may have. Uh, and then obviously hydrate well. And then you essentially just have to 
watch the physique. I like as soon as you wake up, ideally I'd probably want to get seven to eight hours sleep so that hopefully if they sleep well, they wake up and then you assess the physique as they wake up. But depending on which show holds more importance. So you could also hold back a little bit and perhaps not go as aggressive on pushing in as much sodium and perhaps just try and utilize, which isn't going to be that, you know, deleterious to the physique. You could just use citrulline um, and then have a moderate carbohydrate pump up. Again, you're talking about maybe losing 2% in the scheme of things. And that would be a lot safer in terms of managing how you look. Cause you could essentially just say that it's like having a refeed on a normal week of training. You have a crazy session, you look insane and then you just keep food super low till you wake up the next morning and then just assess the look. But you would know where your ceiling is from a muscle glycogen um, saturation perspective. So the next day, that would make it a little bit easier. So I think if it were me, I'd probably be a little bit more conservative and just keep sodium consistent rather than pushing in larger doses on the first show. And then I would go for broke the next day in terms of you can um, try and knock it out of the park. But I think if you do that and you're not you know, irresponsible with the amount of carbohydrate you're pushing in and you're being conservative. And again, knowing that if you're watching the physique every 20, 30 minutes, you can top up more if you need to, then you'll be fine. I just make sure that you train um, there afterwards. And then obviously you just got to deal with the tan, wash it off and try and. Yeah. Or try to maintain it and maybe get it touched up the next day. Yeah. 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 So, true. Yeah. I'll, so I'll, essentially, I'll just wash it off. I, so I hate that. Essentially you're saying because we're shoveling in, carbs and sodium for the first show after that we want to take in potassium to counteract the sodium that we had in right? well if we're taking on more sodium so if on yeah. the first situation i said if we were going we were going to send it on the first one so you're trying to get your pro card that night mm -hmm. um and then the next day you had your other divisions if you really went for it and that was where you wanted to send it home and then as a result of that you know that you have higher blood sodium levels then you need to attenuate that by taking in more fluid and also by changing the ratio by obviously increasing your potassium, bearing in mind that the more water you drink, when you go to the bathroom, you're going to excrete more sodium as well. So you're peeing that out, but you also want to top up more potassium because remember, we want to have a higher potassium to sodium ratio. Alex, yeah. yeah, your body will do that on its own, but anything that we can do exogenously to help contribute to that is going to be beneficial. Whereas if we don't do that and we are a little bit more conservative and we just you know, have our normal dose of sodium, we track our intakes that we take, then the, the next day there's less variables that we need to worry about because you're not really going to have any flux and electrolyte shift. So basically once you've done that, you've taken care of the sodium imbalance, brought your electrolytes back into balance, mm -hmm. you've gone to the gym, you've trained, you've flushed out as much glycogen as you could possibly can. It's probably not going to be fully depleted though, right? You probably wouldn't say. Well, this is where you also need, depending on your category. So, for example, yeah. if, if I had a guy doing physique, I'd be like, go and train. If he's training the next day, I probably wouldn't. You don't want to thrash it and be overly sore. I would yeah. treat it as probably like a 45 to 60 minute entire body pump session just to move some of that carbohydrate yeah. around. But again, you don't want to fully deplete muscle glycogen stores because obviously then you've got to fill it up again the next day. Right. Yeah. You're going to hold more food. So yeah. it's more just about gauging. And this is where if you know how much carbohydrate you've had, you would have an idea. You know, if you're on stage that day, you've done nothing other than say you've done two divisions. You're not going to burn through a ton <laughs> of carbohydrate um, in that moment. So Crazy, you, yeah. Do you know what I mean? So it's it's going to take a while for, for, for that to happen. If, if anything, you might have just, you know, gone through some liver glycogen stores, maybe a little bit of muscle glycogen, and then, you know, you have your normal dinner meal, might be just a little bit of potato and some protein, and you'll be back to, you know, at the top of the ceiling, and the next day you don't really need to do anything. Yeah. But if you're a bodybuilder, you obviously want to leave your legs alone because you want to try and keep them nice and fresh. Yep. So things like you know, elevating them, trying to get some of the blood out, perhaps even, you know, a bit of a light massage just to move any of that potential fluid that's being held so that you wake up and you're, you know, you're nice and relaxed. Always say a relaxed physique will always correlate with, you know, a really good looking physique. People that are super stressed tend to suffer from edema. Yeah. Actually, that's a really good point for these first timers on a rookie is try to relax as much as you can, keep your stress levels as down as much as you possibly can. And try to stay off your feet. Like if you're, yeah. like don't be walking around, standing around for no good reason. Don't don't pace around the backstage area. No, stay stay off your feet. Don't do that. Lie down, keep legs up if you possibly can. Definitely stay off your feet. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I'm looking at MG when I said that because he was yeah exactly he was the paces. 
Man, I was, yeah. ready, I was ready to rip that curtain off and just... just You're ready to charge. Run to a brick man, yeah. I know. I was ready. Yep. Um, we got a question about thoughts on PTs that are not qualified in nutrition, providing clients with nutrition advice. Someone needs to stop this. <laughs> what, what do you think, MG? PTs giving nutrition advice. Yeah, I mean, it depends on the type of advice. Like, mm, like if it's if it's if it's very generalised advice on you know some some meal suggestions that may help them, you know, eat better or a substitution of something that might you know lower their calories if their goal is weight loss or something that they might include that might help them bump a bit more protein because they're not getting enough protein. I don't think there's any issues with that at all. Um, but at the end of the day, like a clinical nu- nutritionist, if you just look at my wife for example. You know, did a did a very long degree at university to 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 study that, and there's just things like, you know, gut health, and and unless you studied and and have done the course, you're just not going to understand it. So I think it's really about the level of advice that's given, yeah. Um, ensuring that you know you're not overstepping your marker, and it definitely does happen all the time. Like prescribing specific foods when you have no idea, um, you know, or have n- no background on on the client's blood work or anything like that because you like it because you're a bodybuilder, um. You know, you potentially you can run yourselves in, into some problems, but, um, you know, there's people out there with issues like, you know, I've, I've heard clients who are celiac who have worked with other coaches being prescribed foods in their thing that have gluten in it. It's like, like seriously, like that's the, that's like the most basic thing ever. So I think some general advice um, within a certain realm is okay, but I think there's definitely a lot of people overstepping the mark. Yeah, if you've got a general health condition or an intolerance, something like that, and you need someone that's got a bit more education. For sure. Um, if it's comp prep, then you need someone that spe- specifies in that. Yeah. Um, even even if it's a like a photo shoot or like where you're trying to get super lean and it's not a comp, but you're pretty much treating it like a that yeah. level of condition or getting at least like 60 to 80% there. Yeah. Um, yeah, you don't want to get some general advice of a PT that hasn't done any of that before. Doesn't have but, I, but I equally want to say this, right? The being a nutritionist is not regulated, right? Like mm-hmm. a dietitian is. Yeah. So there's a million nutritionists on Instagram. Mm-hmm. My question that you should be asking is what type of background or what type of degree does this nutrition has? Is it a two week week in Instagram course? Or is it a bachelor in nutritional medicine? Because they're very, very different. And what you can learn in two weeks on the weekend on, on, you know, a web course versus a proper degree is very different. So, but anyone can call themselves a nutritionist. That's the thing. It's not regulated. So, so I'm as a comfort coach. You're sure, right? Just need to like do your research. Look for somebody who's got proven results, who's got you know um, reviews, and um, and just take the extra time to find someone that actually has the skill set to do what is needed. And, and ask a lot of questions. Like if you're the client, ask a lot of questions, ask them to explain their rationale. They should be able to explain it. If they say to you, no, nah, just do what I, t- I tell you to do. <laughs> For sure. Then For yeah. Sure. yeah. Anything to add there, Scotty? No, not really. I think you don't know what you don't know. So <laughs> if you are, some, I always think you should stay in your, in your own lane. If someone asks me a question about a radiator to do with a car, it's not my level of expertise. I would say perhaps you want to go and talk to X, Y, and Z. So if you're a personal trainer and you have a basic understanding, I think it's important that you just stay within the confines of that. Whereas if you start to try and exceed your scope of practice, then you're stepping outside um, the line. And this is why it's, you know, there's no real regulation. I know Sports Nutrition um, Australia are trying to do that. And there's, you know, you can ask your coach, are they insured? Are they registered? Um, And, Theoretically, a lot of people, well, actually, I don't even know, to be honest, whether you, I don't, I, don't, I don't actually think legally you need to, but if obviously someone does prescribe someone some bad nutrition, then technically they could get themselves into hot water if they don't have any um, insurance. But I think there's just too many cookie cutter personal trainers who perhaps in our space in comp prep have seen that there is a big demand for it now. And obviously when there's demand, there's usually money to be made. And a lot of people view it as perhaps an easy way to top up, make a bit of extra money. But if it's not your area of expertise and it's outside of your scope of practice, then go and educate yourself within that space and then come back to it versus, because if you don't, and especially in a field like ours, you can do a lot of harm to someone. You know, you might think it's just about, you know, manipulating calories, but if you have 
no, say you're working with a female and you have no understanding of their sex hormones or their menstrual cycle or how to manage and negate those things, then you can do a lot of harm and it can take a lot of time to fix that. And it's not just a matter of if they had a bad relationship with food, it can lead to, you know, a, a wide scope of things that just yeah. far exceed um, what you originally thought maybe just could go wrong. So well, yeah, long story short, just stay in your own lane. You don't know what you don't know. And if someone ever asks me something and I don't know the answer, I'll always be like, I'm not too sure, but let me go and do some research and I'll come back to you. Yeah. I think it's not only uh, the advice, but also the planning, the, 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 the phases that you need to go through. You know, should they really be doing a fat loss phase? Should they be trying to build their metabolism first? Like it's those kind of things there also that people need to be educated in. Mm -hmm. it's like how to actually how to actually plan someone's someone's year out for sure yeah like a good a good example of what mt just said which is a perfect point man is really well brought up is like people come to us all the time like i just want to get lean and we're like all right let's look at what you think you're eating and typically the first thing we do is we actually try and make them eat a bit more right we try and yeah. build up first and that's just because you know we already know that the position they're starting from is not healthy so to to keep them dieting or eating less is not going to be a good decision. Even though we know that's what they want at the moment, we, ha we, as, we as coaches have to make the right decision and say, actually, this is what you need to do for this period of time, and then that will come. So, so it is really important to think about the long term and what each phase is going to look like. Yeah. And we know that 90% of females that come to us, they've been under eating for way too long because they've been trying to fat loss their whole life and it hasn't worked. And the first thing you've got to tell them is... Yeah, we're not going to fat loss right now. We're going to eat more. We're going to eat more food, and they don't like I know. it. I know. That's what's going to set them up for success. Definitely. Uh, I've got a bit of an interesting question. Uh, I heard that people use steroids until a year out before doing ICN. So <laughs> specific. That's so specific. specific. So Is specific. it possible? Is it possible? Well, technically, yes, it's possible. Is it ethical? <laughs> Definitely not. Does it happen? Does it happen? Potentially, who knows? Um, I think yeah, a lot of the natural... One thing that we have to give credit, all the federations, if there's any uncertainty if someone perhaps is bending the rules, like they drug test. Yep. But MG, you do it. I remember at your show, we were having a conversation about, um, you know, drug testing, yada, yada. For sure, man. We, we've. I mean, I, I literally yesterday just... Um, got off the phone with someone who trains at my gym who is the nurse who's going to be there on the show for april 23rd so yeah. um the kits are all ready to go it definitely happens and just so everyone knows there's no system to the testing it's not like you know we pick every third person or we will pick anyone that we want to pick to test we will test mm -hmm. yeah so you test on the day it's a urine yeah. test right absolutely with the with the nurse that'll be there that'll yeah. be there with you everything gets sent off but for anyone who's like if you're someone who's asked this question and knows someone who's doing it or thinking about or is thinking about doing it, there's compounds out there that can stay in your system up to two years. Two mm -hmm. years. Now imagine that feeling of like doing it, thinking you're fine, and then getting that report that has you banned and shamed for life. Like, yeah, it's, uh, it's it's. And there's some people that try to cheat the system, and we really hope they don't sleep well at night. So, yeah. yeah, there's a federation for that. Just do it in the other ones. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, okay. Next, uh, how long do you recommend an off-season to go from bikini to sports? Uh, this person is strong in their lower, but just needs to work on their upper. So recommendations for off-season if you're trying to move up in category. It's just so hard to, it's, it's hard it's to, really judge. Hard to answer because it's, it's so person. specific. Yeah, but let's just say if they're like a bikini athlete yeah. and they're at the top level of bikini, yeah. they want to move up. Yeah. Minimum 18 months. Yeah, I was going to say that the shortest period of time is from one full revolution of the season. Like, that's a minimum. Yeah. So if you just competed in season B, you're going to have to wait till probably the season B next year to, to have enough off season to then grow, to then prep again. That's like the minimum if you're which, like. Which, really which, is, which would be 18 months between shows. Mm -hmm. uh, tw I'm, I'm thinking 12. Yeah, that's, well, oh, I thought you meant a 12 month off season and then you start prepping. Yeah, like if you can do it within 12 months, show to show within 12 months and increase and grow and move up in a category, doing pretty freaking good, doing real good. I think the one division that would have more of an opportunity 
to be able to potentially do it sooner would be perhaps bikini because they don't have to go through that recovery phase mm-hmm. post comp. Yeah. So that window of time that they can allocate in, in terms of like, yeah, they'll be lean, but they're not going to be like, you know, banged up. So you can probably just give them a bit more food for a couple of weeks and then boom, now it's time to work. I, I, yeah. I think it just comes down to the athlete. Like are you, how willing are you to treat your off season like every day as if, this is your very last day of your off season. You need to make it count because I think a lot of people don't realize what actually can be achieved. If you treat your improvement season, like when everyone's in contest prep, they're hundred percent, they're locked in. If you apply that same discipline to your improvement season, then you can do a hell of a lot in 18 months, in 24 months. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But if you're looking at making that jump and not just competing, but being competitive in opens and holding your own and potentially That's challenging, right. Yeah. then I would say I think spending two years in the improvement season can be so good from so many avenues, not just to improve your physique, but to learn to appreciate your body for what it can do and not always just how it looks. Get strong. Mm-hmm. And, and then that way when you finish that, you'll have had times where you felt uncomfortable or you've had to eat more food than perhaps you want to eat. You've had to look at a body that perhaps you don't love the look of aesthetically but you know what it can do in the gym. So when you come out of a prep, it makes it a little bit easier to go back to that point because you've been there and then you know that beast, you understand it and, uh, and you know, you can be productive and you know what can be done in that amount of time. Yeah. And we're talking about, you know, if you're going from a you know, top level bikini to an average sports, <laughs> it's different to if you want to go to a very competitive sports model, like open shooting for the top. That's mm-hmm. where, like there's a lot there's a lot of time you need to grow for sure. Um, so it really depends on where you're at now and where you want to be and what your goals are. And then we're talking females who don't want to eat a lot of food, don't want to gain a lot of weight, are worried about body fat, probably going to argue with their coach multiple times about doing a mini cut along the way. So that's just going to take even longer to get where you want to go, right? So it really depends on your level of commitment to push in one direction and only have the sole focus of I need to grow to, to be competitive in that division and I, I want to do it in the most shortest period of time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next one. So cardio. Cardio preference for competitors who are struggling with conditioning. Tell us, Scotty, what is, what's, the, what's the cardio, what's the best cardio? <laughs> stepper. The stepper. <laughs> Sideways on the stepper? And kicking your glutes in the air. And kicking in the air as you do it. That's how I do my cardio. Yeah. yeah. Can nah. you please do a video. Um <laughs> booty band too. Ca- cardio gets and a, a waist trainer. And a waist trainer. And a waist trainer. Please. Yeah, yeah. You're gonna get me one, aren't you? Yeah, I'm gonna yeah. You should use one for your prep. I should. I should. Um Cardio gets a bad rap, but essentially it's just a tool in the toolbox that we have access to. It's just important that you understand when to use it and how to use it. I think it can be abused like a calorie deficit can be as well. And I think it depends on where you're at and where you want to implement it. Uh, There's times where like I have certain athletes in the improvement season who actually do a little bit of cardio, but it's not for the reason that most people would think it's to actually help with digestion and allows them to be able to get in the amount of food that they need to get in. It's not a high volume amount of cardio. It literally just helps them push down the food they have to push in. But in terms of getting lean, which is the context I assume we're talking about here, Mm -hmm. it's just knowing when you want to play that card and also working out where you're going to program it. Like you need to factor in what does this person's lifestyle and well, that's what I do. What do they do for work? Yeah. And what are their values? So obviously, are they a husband? Are they a wife? Are they Have they got kids? Are they a mum or a dad? Because all those things need to be factored in as well. If you're going to try and give, say you've got a single mum and she's got to do cardio and she's got to train. If you're going to try and get her to do cardio at the end of the day, perhaps when she's just worked nine hours, she's trained, she's done her kids, she's got to do lunches, it's not realistic and you're setting that person up for failure rather than success. Versus if you can try and be smart about where you program it, it really needs to fit in with the athlete's schedule because no one really loves doing cardio. So I'll typically communicate when's the best time in your week where you have availability that you can liberate some of that time towards doing 
30 minutes or whatever it is, I'll typically give a beats per minute recommendation uh, or it might be a calorie recommendation. And then let's say that it's wanting to do 300 calories on the cross trainer. Okay, I did that in 30 minutes. The machine doesn't know that you're in a deficit, doesn't understand all those things. So to allow for metabolic adaptation, the next time I might say, okay, I want you to do that same amount of calories, but do it in a minute less. So that it's essentially a form of overload or you could add a little bit more, more time or, uh, or energy expenditure. So it just, context is really important and it needs to be specific to the individual, but I think you need to be careful how early you play and also be mindful about where you put it regarding your training. Yep. If you typically do 45 minutes of cardio and then you've got to go and do weights and you're in a low carbohydrate state, the chances are you're chewing through a lot of your carbohydrate stores. And so you're asking your body to perform optimally in a really, really suboptimal environment. So I would yep. typically say do it after you've strength trained yep. um, and perhaps even do it in an ideal world. If it was me from a, a, uh, a, a fat loss perspective, doing it at the end of the day. So for example, if you can do your weights earlier in the day, if you can do some cardio at night and essentially you sleep low, then you're more likely to be in a state of lipolysis. So obviously you're going to liberate more fat while you sleep. You're not really doing anything. So it's not as not really going to impact you as much unless if it wakes you up. But um, but it would really, yeah, it's, I know it's a really vague answer, but it's really context no, specific. It's, it is because... You know, like given that example about the single mom that has kids, probably can't leave the house. Does she yeah. have equipment at her house where she can jump on a treaty? Or is she spending her night getting her steps in, walking around the kitchen counter, which I have people doing that, right? So it really just depends on then their work. You know, MG, you got people that are tradies that pump out a lot of activity throughout the day. So you'd probably give them no structured cardio, right? So it's really it, it really depends on someone's lifestyle and their time commitments and, and what they can do and their equipment availability. I have people that can afford to go to the gym twice a day, one for the weights, one for, for cardio and have the time to do that. Some people, some people don't. Yeah. And that's why we use steps. And I, I, you know, I've heard people say, Oh, steps are a terrible way of tracking. I completely disagree with that a thousand percent. Like look at me for my example, obviously in my prep every day, I couldn't keep under 17,000, right? Just cause I'm in the gym 12, 13 hours a day. So obviously a big problem. Um, sometimes, and it's, that's why growing becomes difficult, but, I did not have to do one piece of cardio because 17,000 steps every day is a ton of movement. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I typically will utilize cardio when I have someone who is just not a big mover. Yeah. Um, if the step volume is high enough, it's, it's rare that I do have to use it. But then again, there's certain examples of people who, as we're getting close and it's right near the end, we might throw a little bit in just to try and push things along a little faster. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I do have a preference of equipment. Like if someone says to me, what am I doing it on? I typically only use the treadmill at a, at a walk or a cross trainer. Yeah. Um, and I guess we just got to talk about our terminology. Like when we say cardio, because it's hard to distinguish, we mean like something on a piece of equipment, right? For a, spirit, for a period of time. For a period of time. Yeah. Whereas when we say steps, it could even mean going for a half an hour walk, which would simulate being on the treadmill for half an hour, but we're just going to call it steps. Because in my prep, I didn't do any cardio, but I went for structured walks for like 45 minutes or so. So, but we call it steps. So just because we've got to distinguish between yeah, the two. Yeah, for sure. People yeah. Get, it's, it's, yeah. it's context, right? It's, yeah. it's and, and like in, the, in comparison to, to MT, my steps were just walking around my gym all day. So yeah. there were no like structured, I'm going out for 30 minutes straight, but across a 12, 13 hour day in the gym, I would accumulate 15 or 16,000 steps. So that I didn't have to go for that structured walk. Yeah. So the only thing sometimes I prescribe to people is say you've got to do 12,000 steps a day. I'd say in those 12,000, try to do 30 minutes of continuous activity, right? Okay, so it's not yeah. 12,000 of you just walking backwards and forwards every now and then and accumulates 12,000. I sometimes say, okay, but try to do something continuous for 30 minutes, having your heart rate up and let that go include into your 12,000. So sometimes we use things like that. Otherwise, someone may just wave their arm in the air like this to get their 12,000, right? Or use a vacuum cleaner and have their arms go backwards and forwards to accumulate their 12,000. <laughs> or wash their car. I found that when I wash my car, my steps go up. Well, you always <laughs> wash your car. I'm moving my arm. Hey, three weeks ago, you washed my car for me. Yeah, I did because a bird crapped all over it. Yeah. <laughs> what a man. Um, 
we've answered this question before, but we'll just cover it off real quick. Um, how to get a glute ham tie-in. So we covered off two points. One is you need development in that area so that you have something to show, and then you need to get lean. So development, we're talking obviously glute exercises, hamstring exercises. Yeah, so glute, just so that it's glute, we're talking glute max development. Yep. Yeah, which glute is like development, hip thrust, that, step up, that type of thing. Yeah, and anything that puts your glute in a stretch position, so deep lunging, deep step ups, deep squatting, deep leg press. Anything um, deep deflection. Yeah, anything like that. Um, even even um, uh, uh, hamstring exercises, so whether they're, they're isolation or compound, that also give you a deep stretch too. Um, so they're going to be super important to get the musculature that you need there. And then obviously getting lean. It's a trouble area for females to get lean in that area. It just takes time and persistence. And it may be the last area that you get lean in. Another thing too is that's normally where you're more estrogen dominant in that area. So if you are on the pill or have a hormonal imbalance, and you may have a tougher time um, in trying to get lean in that area too. So anything you want to add there, boys? No. no, spot on. Well, I think the, the thing that we just see most common is, you know, we have female athletes whose upper body is in, dialed in, backs lean, midsections lean, obliques, abs, and the bottom half isn't. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, it's not a magic fix. It's, it's as a coach or, or as an athlete, you need to talk to your coach on whether the, the trade-off is to keep dieting and potentially lose some of the size up top for the condition that you're going to get at the bottom. And if your division specifically asks for a good hamstring time, then to me, the trade-off would be worth it. Yeah. And I think the people that have the best glute ham tie-in are actually the ones that have the most development, not the leanest. Um, so I think development is definitely key. And what does that mean? <laughs> more time in off season, eating more food and training hard, which you don't want to, which I normally don't want to do. Right. So yes, yeah. it's, it's just why a lot of people, I think they look at those parts I didn't get lean enough. Sometimes you just didn't have enough tissue to push mm. against that because if you yep. take the body composition away, like, yeah, you look at someone that's paper thin skin conditioned, you know, you can see the actual muscle belly. But if you've got someone that doesn't have good quality tissue, and this is where you've got to be honest with yourself. And again, we're speaking about females here majoritively, but a lot of females, they may store a lot of composition in their improvement season. So they think, I've got huge glutes. But in reality, you're just storing lots of composition there. And then, when you diet down, you have a tough time trying to bring that area in because there's so much body composition there. So, yeah, bear, bear that in mind. The more tissue that you have from a quality muscular perspective, the easier it's going to be to be able to get that area and show it in terms of looking better conditioned. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, okay, we're going to move it to business focus. We've got a couple of business-related questions. Um, some person asked... How much do comp prep coaches normally charge? Um, I, I've seen it between the 60 to 120 a week. I've seen above that, 150, 200 more. Um, I hope that coaches that are charging that much are wiping your butt for you because that's a lot of money. Um, there's a lot of good coaches that sit within that first range that I kind of gave. So, yeah, and it depends how much you want to spend. Like. And some people are happy to throw away 200 bucks a week and just be like, yeah, I'll stick with those guys. Yeah. What do you guys think? No, you're spot on, man. I like, just to like put it out there, none of us are over 100 bucks a week. No. So, and we've spoken on numerous episodes what we deliver in terms of the services and what you get as a coach. So if you're paying more than that, what I just said, and you're not getting the stuff that we're, we've been saying, I think, yeah, potentially you need a recess. Yeah, money well spent maybe somewhere else. Yeah. Somewhere Most of the Yep. I was going to say, most of the top coaches that I, well, when I say top, people that I would deem to be, if someone said, who are your top five coaches in natural bodybuilding? Of those people, I don't know that any of them are over, I don't think any of them are over 100 bucks, maybe 100, 105 max. Yeah. So no one's yes. in that, that top range. Yeah, yep. For sure, man. Well said. Yeah. Someone asked, uh, what apps and tools do we use to streamline our business operation? We kind of touched on this a little bit, but... I can just list ones I use or ones that I've used. I started off with Google Sheets um, for programming, planning, and all the information you need to give a client and all for them to track all their data. But then I moved to an app. Um, so I utilize an app. And then communication systems that I use is Facebook Messenger for communication. 
That's pretty much it. And I use Google, like all my stuff is saved on Google Drive. So I can jump on MG's laptop, log into my Google Drive and see all my clients' information. You can get Google Drive on your phone too. So that's pretty much what I use. I don't use email for client communication or anything like that. How about you, MG? Yeah, so pretty much the same. So we have a, a, a tracker that we use through Excel, which is a Google Sheet, which is live. Um, we have a, a website that um, is where the training program and data is all stored, which we just put as an icon on um, your phone's home screen. And then we use we use Loom now as well, which Scott, Scott started using, which is just the check-in software videos for check-ins, which we've just transferred across and absolutely loving it. Been awesome. So thanks, Scotty. Good. Yeah, Maybe, Scotty, what do you use? Yeah, same. So I use, um, I have, I refer to it as a master template. So it's, uh, it covers all of the periodization from nutritional side of things as well as from a training perspective. And that runs through Excel um, in OneDrive. So it's all online. Same thing. If I want to jump on someone else's computer, I can do it. Um, but everything syncs up in the cloud. So we all have access. And, uh, and I send, um, my check-ins by email, but they're Loom. So Loom is a um, it's a video software where you can put whatever you're doing on the screen, records it. You can go through your check-in and navigate your um, your way through what you want to speak about, and then they just click on the link and they can watch the video. And then all of my communications done through um, Instagram direct message in terms of if someone needs to speak to you about something or any uh, movements that I need to see. So I get a lot of my athletes. We look spend a lot of time looking at training side of things. So loads, progressive schemes and um, movements and, and whatnot. And so any movements that I want to see, um, they just send it through via Instagram because it's quick and easy and that's how we communicate. Kind of similar to what you do, MG. You just use Messenger. Yeah. And yeah. S- Scotty loves sending me MT's check-in. Isn't that right? Yeah, fuck. I'm never going to do that. <laughs> no, man, I can't. I, I, I actually... When we went home after that, Super went home, I actually I was like, that's really... Like, that, that's... <laughs> That's not that's not good enough on my end. Oh, so, relax, it's fine, man. No, it's just a, no, no, it's in, in, in all honesty, I actually, I actually, I actually felt a little really bit bad. I'm like, nah, cause nah it, it's cool because it's you guys, but if it had been someone else, it's so. Nah. I'm, I'm you know what I would have? Fe- you know what I would have felt bad for if you just ignored the check in, sending it to the wrong person who's got the same name is fucking not a big deal. And if anyone ever, if anyone ever felt upset about that, I'll, I would say just calm down, guys. <laughs> Yeah, but I've never done that before. So anyway, I love, like I love that mistake I love it. happened. And I actually did. I said to MT, I've changed it. So now um, when I type in the email, it comes up, I have Galanti and Trimboli. So that way, yeah, when right. I, the first key that I type, I'm like, that way. Because hey, you guys I, are the, the two Michaels. Hey, I'll, I'll, everyone knows how close me and MT are. I love keeping tabs on what he's doing. So sending me his check in, totally fine. At least yeah, now I've got, every, I've got every portion with, of his life. With, with each other. <laughs> I hope you're not. Copy my calories and macros, all right? Right. I want to look like you, so I'm copying everything in yours. Everything. I want to look like Jay Cutler, so I'm going to eat his diet too. I even went out and bought your pan as well. <laughs> <laughs> I love my pan. Come on, man. We know you, um, man. All right, let's finish it off here. Someone asked, what's your biggest challenge uh, in business? I know, MG, obviously you own a gym, right? So, And actually, Scotty, you do too, right? So I'm sure that your challenges might be a little bit different to mine. Um, I don't know. Do you want to start off, MG? Do you have anything? Like one of your biggest challenges? Oh, plenty, man. Well, yeah. Well, so we've obviously got a few businesses going at the moment and they all present different challenges. But I think from a gym perspective, it's like I have a team of staff as well. So making sure that one, the gym is continually growing so that we're getting new people in the door and we're keeping all our existing people. So mm-hmm. strategies that to keep that happening, but making sure that the staff have enough hours to keep them satisfied, which is probably the the most difficult part, having multiple staff who you know equally are looking for more hours. So you need to keep producing inquiry and referrals to be able to meet that um, meet that demand of hours. Um, is probably probably the biggest challenge I would say, um, because you know it's it's easy to sort of keep one person fully occupied, but when you're trying to keep six occupied. And you know, the, the everyone wants more hours. I would say that that is definitely challenging. So you know, we're we're doing different things. Like as a gym, you know, we do social media campaigns, we do Facebook advertising campaigns, we do special offers, we do cheaper deals, we do um, all types of things to try. And some work and some don't. But we're always on the front foot with that type of stuff. Um, and I think it's just about being creative and adaptive. Otherwise, 
you know, we, we have an amazing retention rate. We don't really lose people that come in the door, but you have to keep growing. And especially if you want to keep, you know, five people um, at, at a wage that they can live on. So, yeah. How about you, Scotty? Biggest challenge? I think, Challenges? Yeah, from a from the um, the gym's perspective, it's, I mean, my online coaching has just become a whole almost separate business. And it's, it's more just trying to make sure that, um, I don't withdraw too much from that side of things as well because I step back. I've stepped back a lot. Unfortunately, I've got really good staff at the gym, and similar to, to MG, it's important to give um, give those guys hours so that they can still pay their mortgages and do all those things. But um, it's also from a, I guess, a member engagement thing as well. So there's perhaps. I mean, I used to, when I first started, when I opened. I used to run all the classes because no one was going to work it as hard as I was. And I wasn't in a position that I could afford to have X amount of people on and pay their wages. So I had to cover it all myself. And so as the years go on, you do less and less, you know, I run three classes a week and they're always really, really busy because there's a lot of people who perhaps don't get to see me anymore. So it's just making sure I'm very big on every person that comes through our door, uh, our door, our door feels that love and care and that they're not mm-hmm. another number. And so that, they don't feel that perhaps because I am not um, coaching them as much, so to speak, that they don't feel that love and that care or that I am not still invested in their health and fitness goals. So I try and make a point to still, you know, even if I'm in my office every now and then, pop out and, and see how people are going and talk about their training and just give everyone the time of day, which it does get challenging the busier that you get and obviously, you know, having family and, and, and commitments as well. But, um, but no, it's good. I, in no way, shape, or form would I do it differently. I feel like I'm, there's a lot of people out there who perhaps aren't in that position. I've, I'm very grateful that I'm able to do what I do, and I, I don't view what I do as work. I literally go to my gym every day, and I love every single minute of it. So, it's awesome, man. It's awesome. I think for me, my biggest challenge was more self confidence, like confidence in my abilities, and not like having like some kind of imposter syndrome, like someone's going to find me out like I'm no fucking good. <laughs> it's more like having confidence in myself. I think that. And then the second thing is disconnecting from the fact that you're a coach, you're trying to coach someone, but ultimately you can't control whether they follow it or not. And that in a way, your coaching abilities is not really a direct correlation on how they perform in their results. Like it is but you don't have real overall control and learning. You definitely don't have any fucking control about comp results. Like you have no fucking control. All you can do is give make sure they look their best and you have no control over whether they're going to do well or not. Like absolutely no control. So that's kind of been a challenge because you think that their result reflects on you and it does in a way, but it also doesn't. So you can't let it change you either way. As you kind of said before, don't let it be humble. Whether they do well or they don't, just continue to be hum- humble in what you do and just continue to try to level up in any way. Yeah, man. I remember, I remember this saying is like, respect as a coach or a leader comes from either admiration or fear, right? Which makes sense. And there's mm. like, there's no way I'm ever going to be the fear guy. So mm. I'm going to base my whole business around making sure I'm the admiration leader. So like, you know, people look up to me and go, oh, what a great guy. Like, look how he leads by example. And that's... I'm going to be accountable to him for those reasons, not because I'm scared of what he's going to say to me. Yeah. And you can control that too because that's what you do and what you reflect. For sure. Right? For sure. Yeah. It's, you have total control over that. So we're going to leave it there, boys. Um, it's a good it's a good thing to, to end on. But um, I'm looking forward to this weekend. I'm looking forward to this Sunday. All the best to everyone that's going to hit the stage. Definitely. Enjoy yourself. Remember come the up, day. And Get come up and say hi, guys. guys. If anyone's listening, come up and say hi. Come and say hi. Are we gonna are we gonna wear our little prep coach hoods? It's thirty, it's 30 degrees, man. It's only thing. Yeah, so I'm gonna bring it, but yeah, so. you'll, you'll have to just um whatever photos you take, just take them. Don't upload them. Just I'll send you a screenshot. Just crop my head and just put me yeah. in there so I don't get FOMO, all right? Can I can I wear your hoodie for a day, Scott? I just I always wanna to, wanna to be like, yeah, bro, like you. Well, so. you can. Thanks, you'll man. probably fill it out a bit more than me though. <laughs> Man, we're, gonna, we're gonna miss you this Friday, Scotty. We'll have us. Yeah, I'm you on. I know. Yeah, no, well, you got you got Sue's on Friday, and then the, is the comp on the Saturday or the Sunday? Sunday, 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 Sunday. Okay, Sunday. New venue, so it'll be exciting. Yeah, I'm interested to know how that how that is, and just the 
the look of it all and the backstage and the logistics of it all will be it'll be good. It'll be good for them as well, just to iron out any teething potentially problems yeah. that may may front, you know, come up. Yeah. Exciting. All right, boys. Yeah. You enjoy the rest of your day and we'll all chat very, very soon. Thanks, Thanks, boys. Take care. See Thanks you, for listening. Thanks, boys. Thanks, See you guys. Bye.